I'm joined today by Jack Perfume Personae, host of the Perfume Nationals podcast. How are you doing today? Wonderful. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks so much for leading me on this crazy journey for taking this uh, awesome leap of faith, you and Orton, and uh, throwing this out into the world. I (laughs) never thought I would be uh, like standing, as the kids say, for uh, for scent uh, to anybody, let alone to my wife and my male friends. So uh, this has just been an awesome uh, journey. So thank you for putting us all on this path. Thank you for listening. I'm really happy to hear that. Honestly, the like handful of uh, fans and uh, people interested in perfume because of this that we have right now, like exceeds my expectations of uh, how far I would ever get with this extremely specific autistic vision of uh, perfume and 80s soap operas and reactionary politics so uh (laughs) i'm I'm glad it resonates with someone (laughs) it has just been a blast and it's it's fun because there's i think everybody is such a basket you know a cornucopia of so many different things that seem contradictory and i really learned that when i was in india i would bump into these gaming nerds and comic book nerds and uh, manga nerds in delhi india and so they would have this common language that was outside of their language and i think this sort of feeling of it's not just something that's happened in america i feel like uh, this sort of uh, disequilibration or just feeling disconnected from society just happening all over the place and so if we can find some unique way to connect and talk about something that's off the beaten path not political not religious you know something that's uh shared i think that's what's been really cool about this and today we're going to talk about malls and uh, just, we'll see, and movies, malls and movies, and just see where the conversation leaves, leads. Uh, where's, what is your experience with malls and uh, why do you feel so nostalgic about them? Well, I've always found the mall to be an extremely restorative and comforting space. Even before Vaporwave existed as a genre, uh, which, you know, basically takes like 80s mall aesthetics and like, uh, waiting room type elevator music and uh, amplifies the spaciness of them and whatnot. Uh, I was always firmly anchored in the eighties, I guess, because I was born in 87 and they say that you're, you uh, view the time right when you're a baby and right before that as a kind of like uh, utopia for the rest of your life. Um, So yeah, I have no nostalgia for the sixties, not really, even for the 70s, because they seem so harsh and unfriendly. Um, but the 80s, I have always just been enraptured with the imagery, the fashion, um, the television shows, uh, the political figures, even. I, you know, I love the Reagan presidency. Um, but malls, I get more sad about malls dying than I do about, like, celebrities dying and (laughs) people dying and whatnot um but i remember like a a lot of my big perfume awakening um towards the end of the last decade like 2008 2009 um i lived by the oldest mall in austin highland mall which had then uh was largely a ghost mall and only had a couple of anchor stores left um and there was a lot of like, uh, uh, let's say, racial violence <laughs> there um, from a certain crowd. But uh, I went there and in the like uh, Saudi whatever perfume shops, I found lots of like rare older stuff. And I love the feeling of walking around this ghost mall, just like blind buying different fragrances and taking them home and being totally surprised with what I got. But yeah, I don't know. Just the malls to me represent um, capitalist comfort before the sort of uh, neoliberal end of history of this decade where everything, as we were talking about when you came on my show, is that sort of uh, gray minimalist clapboard mm-hmm. renovation, like the new McDonald's and everything. Yep. Malls are just gorgeous. And speaking of 
malls and movies, I've always had a rule that if a movie takes place in a mall, then it can't be bad. Right. And right. also, if a movie is under 80 minutes, it can't be bad. Yeah, that's always a better feeling. I actually uh, just caught up with Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I'd never even seen it, and that came out in 82. I was born in 81, and uh, I, I grew up as an evangelical Christian. I was really sheltered, so I missed out on 80s culture totally. So when a lot of people had... I was very late coming back to the uh, 80s nostalgia. Like, I didn't like 80s music. Like, I went back and listened to... Because Blondie uh, f makes a little cameo as a cardboard cutout in Fast Times. Um, that's my favorite, I guess, glittering image at the mall. Is uh, <laughs> Damone uh, showing the other dude how to, like, hit on the chick uh, with b the Blondie cutout. And so I went back and listened to Atomic, and I'm like, oh, man, this is great. Uh, so it's just like so much of 80s culture that I totally missed out. I was listening to classical music in the 80s because I was playing violin. So mm -hmm. I missed out on this whole thing. But uh, the mall, uh, so I got this picture here. I'm going to put it up on the uh, stream. The La Cantina in the Panama City Mall. So our 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 city is uh, named after Panama City because they thought it would be a Panama City Panama because they thought it would be a good uh, marketing ploy to get people, I guess, because it was they were doing the Panama Canal or something like that. Like, <laughs> Florida is just like just copycatting, like, hey, come on down to Panama City. And it's, <laughs> it has this like pseudo Latin American aesthetic or something like that. And I remember this place. I just found this picture today or yesterday. And my grandmother would take me to this area and they had you can see there's coffee cups hanging. Hey, it's a cantina, but it's a coffee joint. And they would serve frosted cafe mochas. And I thought those things, I can still remember that taste, like the best uh, frozen mocha that I've ever had. So I go there with my grandmother. So it has a real sentimental uh, feel for it. And there's this other picture here of these two girls sitting on, like they had a fountain, like a wishing well. And it does have this sort of like, I don't know, like New Mexican sort of <laughs> like tile and stuff. It's totally just a pastiche of styles, you know? Um, it's the Six Flags style yeah. here. It's a lot like Six Flags Fiesta, Texas, and San Antonio. Exactly. So, but I have such a like a sentimental callback to that. And you were mentioning like going into those. So they actually had perfume shops that were run by Saudis, in like the... uh, with like discounters. I don't. Oh, okay. You know, I gotcha. I'm, I'm an idiot. I don't know what like race they actually are. The ones that like run those shops that are ubiquitously in uh, dying malls. Right. 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 Yeah. But, yeah. But uh, whatever they are, they had. There were at that time like three of them in Highland Mall. There were a lot more, and these days the stock at most department stores is like pretty uniform. And also at drug stores, like you're not going to run into any surprises in terms of what perfume they have. And that became completely uniform around like 2011. I would say, like, before that, you would go into, like, a Perfume Mania or a CVS or something and happen upon some, like, dusty boxes of some older perfume. But now the stock is all new, all uniform. Um, but at these type of uh, discounter places, that's uh, largely the only place you'll run into, um, like, rare stuff like Yadigan um and reeve gauche and montana all of this in person otherwise you're just gonna have to like blind order online which i'm a big proponent of blind buying things i love blind buying even more than thinking carefully about what i'm going to buy yeah there was this one like kind of dilapidated mall in in delhi and it, it, it was almost it was like an underground it's basically just a couple hall hallways almost like a catacomb and I went in there when when we were back. There. It was probably about 2015 or something like that. I was doing this video about walking around, flaneuring, as the as they say. <laughs> so it's flaneuring around Delhi. And I went down into this little catacomb mall. I can't remember the name of this place, but it had that feel. There was nobody in there. I have no idea. This was like a money laundering operation. There was no one in there at all. And you guys would just come out like, hey, 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 over here, hey, hey. I'm like, ah. Oh. Um, but I did, it did start making me sentimental. The great thing about malls overseas, like in Bangkok, Thailand, and, and in India, malls are huge. They're huge, and everyone is there. It's like taking a time machine. I love it. Like, so I, I think it re the flame of my mall fervor, uh, getting to see these malls at their peak, you know, and then coming back here. And 
uh, Hurricane Michael destroyed our mall, and they realized that just if the mall would have probably limped by for another five years, okay, you know, but uh, when that hurricane hit, they were just like, ah, forget it. So now I'm just yeah. Gonna... And why would people not hang out at the mall? Like it makes no sense. The death of the mall, uh, you know, it makes sense in terms of Amazon sucking up all of the actual sales, but just like aesthetically and in the like the physical space i guess like 10 15 years ago indoor malls were started to be uh considered dated and dead and expensive to maintain because of the air conditioning costs and everything and so they were just replaced with these like uh, uniform strip malls that all have the same like you know array of bed bath and beyond ross marshall's maybe a best buy but even those are leaving um but yeah like when we did our mall episode and went to the galleria the galleria is so lively um and houston is an actually diverse actually exciting city unlike austin which is the uh you know the the self-identifying uh liberal just piece of shit hellhole it's like the it's the widest city in all of Texas, and it's also the most <laughs> liberal. And they don't see the irony there. Know, they call man. Houston an armpit. They call Dallas an armpit. They call San Antonio an armpit. They say the only place I would live in Texas is Austin, and oh, that's the only one with literally only white people in it. It's kind of hmm. like Vermont being multicultural. It's like y'all are ninety nine percent white. Shut the hell up. Come move down here to Alabama and Mississippi and Northwest Florida. Yeah, it's like saying we get. Maine is the only state you'd live in. It's it's just hilarious. Yeah, I got to go to uh, Austin back in, uh, man, I can't remember, it was 2010 or 2011. Man, what year was it? I think it it had to have been 2010. That was kind of the year it really died. (laughs) Yeah, I went, I was in a movie, believe it or not. Uh, A movie premiered at South by Southwest Film Festival. So it was, you know, like a small indie film. And, uh, I was like, man, this is gonna be my break. I'm finally on the screen. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, the the poor director. I think we, we had two showings. I think probably a total of hundred people saw it. Um, I thought it was decent. It was one of those mumble cores, if you remember that whole aesthetic. Oh yeah. Um, so it was in that vein. Amy Simetz was in the movie. She played. I uh, was her ex. Uh, we never were on screen together, but she went on to be in like, oh, man, what's that? Show? There's some show, and then she was like in the Alien Covenant. She was. Uh, I don't know that one dude. Oh, interesting. We were just talking about that on the tech yeah, what did you think that of that I was movie? on. Oh, I thought I thought it was atrocious. Yeah. I I was actually a big fan of Prometheus, yes, which okay. was you. pretty polarizing. I, I thought Prometheus was great, but it. then they just like dumbed that down completely. Yeah. Uh, I I don't believe that Ridley Scott directed that Alien Covenant thing yeah. i feel like that was totally farmed out to an intern that was like he was <laughs> like he was like the character in uh once upon a time in hollywood laying on the bed and there was so <laughs> <laughs> like the cgi looked worse than the cgi in alien resurrection oh, from right. 1998 what, what'd you think like, of a resurrection is that the I, with, i'm very fond of resurrection that's um, the joss whedon one right uh, it is, yeah. and uh, since the rise and fall of Joss Whedon, who is probably the single most unattractive in every way man I can think of. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, before I know who he knew who he was, I was a big fan of Buffy, and I did like uh, Alien Resurrection. But knowing, seeing the Joss Whedon trademarks after uh, he he did that whatever guardians of the galaxy thing that everyone saw and tried to get me to see and after he was you know running his mouth being a male feminist oh, right i i absolutely can't abide him but i i i liked the uh at the time novel uh french grotesquerie uh that was before amelie destroyed all the girls of my generation uh which is jean-pierre Jeunet as well right um but yeah, the, the, at the time, I remember seeing a Resurrection as a kid and my brother saying how bad it was. It was gross. And I instantly it was, liked it. It I, was real, like, uh, just odd. It was, it was, I don't know, it was a pretty unique movie as opposed mm-hmm. to some of these paint-by-the-number things that come out. And they, like, they, the design of the human-alien mm-hmm. hybrid, the product of 
Ripley finally having sex with the xenomorph, uh, it had like a giant pussy on its stomach initially, and right. they like CGI'd that out. Oh, interesting, man! That thing did look gross. Uh, it's so gross. Frown nose asked, "What's Josh, we- Josh Whedon got to do with Alien Resurrection? He either directed it or wrote it. I can't he wrote it. remember. Jean Pierre Genet oh, okay. uh, okay. directed it. it. Yeah, he wrote it. Um, no, I'm actually still, I'm still a fan of Joss's old, older work. I think he just, I, I think he reacted. He got me too'd in his own way. You know, he didn't get me too'd for any, any sexual harassment. He got me too'd for writing that Scarlett Johansson wanted to have a kid. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's the yeah. stupidest me too I've ever heard of in my life. Yeah, if you, you'll, you'll get me too if you write a fictional character that's a female <laughs> that expresses the, any kind of desire to reproduce uh, I'm pretty instead sure. of just, you know, being like a STEM major. Right. I'm pretty sure Tina Fey did the same thing in uh, 30 Rock. Like, I'm like, well, come on, what? What's happening here? But mm-hmm. anyway, that's... But, you know, I don't, I don't care about male feminists being me too I've been completely against me too from the start, um, but... I don't care about Joss Whedon being me too. I mean, really vocal male feminists. I mean, you had it coming. So I, and <laughs> Louis, Louis CK, him. I don't think he did anything wrong. Um, right. But in the, in the me too sense, but I could never abide him because he was such a disgusting, uniquely unsavory male feminist. And again, everyone tried to get me to watch his FX show, uh, which was oh, this just like the... repellent, combination of like good dad humor and like uh women the a message the message was always that like women are always right and women are sensible and men are just like these schlubs and everything and everybody was like jack you'll really like this because it's so dark and what was actually dark and what was actually good was lena dunham's girls which everyone hated right. um but yeah everyone tried to force louis on me and so yeah, the only thing I like about Louis C.K. is that he did nothing wrong for, in the Me Too scenario. Well, and that is the interesting thing, I think, about the, the whole thing we're experiencing here, whether it's perfume nationalism or these just strange cross-pollinations, is that people aren't predictable. You know, like, uh, we have arrived at some middle common ground from very different backgrounds, uh, but we're like, it's just like, I feel like it's been a, uh, the same thing that's happened with our building codes, like we're talking about. Like, I look at these pictures of the mall, and they look, okay, maybe not the best style ever, but it seems like they're trying for something. You know, they're trying to make it a fun environment, inviting, whereas everything that has happened is just in the last 10, 15 years on the political landscape, in churches, um, and in our architecture is just taupe. You know, it's just, and like you said, it needs to be cleaned up quickly. It needs to be functional. If someone pukes, you need to be able to clean it up quickly. So no carpet, um, nothing that could be possibly uh, problematic from whatever perspective, you know. Functional. Literally everything looks like a hospital from yes. restaurants yes. to houses to, you know, no matter what it is, everything looks like a hospital, not just a hospital, but an ugly hospital yep. where you're going to be euthanized. Exactly. Like, that's the look of all of it. This yep. grotesque, like just disgusting minimalism of the 2010s. That's the result of liberal puritanism. Like right. it all stems from liberal puritanism and like this kind of guilt at excess and guilt at ostentatious displays of wealth or beauty or anything. So they just say, let's make everything look like a gray and lime green hospital. Well, and that's what's interesting, too. I mean, if you think, if people would think that perfume nationalism sounds like a contradiction or a paradox, it's like liberal puritanism. I'm like, how stupid does that sound? Um, but, you know, and I think Pogli is really right. At the end of the 18th or 19th century, there was a lot of this, Christians got into politics, and they basically tried to, they, some of them were uh, this form of Christian that believed that if they got people right, Jesus would come back. Like there was, a, that was actually a movement, you know? And so they were trying to police people. And we saw how prohibition worked so well, you know? Um, mm-hmm. But it started going through doing things like that. And now we basically have a secular Puritanism. It's not necessarily God, but it's just basically this progressive taupe. You know, it's just this civilization is this taupe tile, these ceiling tiles and uh, HVAC. You know, it's just... It's very simple and and austere and uh, 
and antiseptic, you know. And look at these pictures of the mall back then. It does. I just have such a, a visceral uh, reminder of being with my grandmother. Looking at this one picture here uh, from Fast Times at Ridgemont, Ridgemont High, uh, there's actually carpet on the mall floor. I was just kind of blown away by that. You know, yeah. Me too. I'm tired of the uh, neoliberal performative hatred of carpet that's existed yep. for the last 15 years where everybody, you know, there are these like memes, these received opinions that people get usually from a TV show. Like uh, about 10 years ago, everyone pretended to be disgusted by mayonnaise. Um, like, you know, <laughs> before, it, before it was brought back as uh, aioli as a hipster thing. <laughs> and now, <laughs> now so everyone <laughs> eats mayonnaise on their French fries, like a European, but, but around like 10 to 12 years ago, everybody, you would mention mayonnaise and they would say like, <laughs> there's something unique about me. I'm scared of clowns. I'm scared of mayonnaise. Yep. And the word moist makes me sick. Yep. But, like, people have acted like that about carpet for so long. And guess mm -hmm. what? Hard floors are not great. No. People people act like it's so, like, clean and easy. No. What happens is you're walking around your fucking house and, it, like, all that dog hair and all that lint just sticks to your feet instead of into the plush, comforting carpet. Yep. And being, like, a 90s millennial kid everybody's house had carpet and it felt like weird and alienating and European when I went to houses that didn't have carpet. And, and it, now it, it feels just sterile. the norm. It feels yeah. sterile. And it goes perfectly with like childless millennials and, you know, just the, just the whole anti-family direction all of this has gone yeah of course you don't need carpet because there's not going to be a baby mm -hmm. that's playing on the floor or anything it's just you at the age of you know 38 watching netflix uh on ssris yep that is it so what is your favorite mall movie or a movie that features mall in a prominent or idiosyncratic way um i have a lot uh, one in particular does not spring to mind as my favorite above all others but um i hate zombies but i love the original dawn of the dead which is kind of the ultimate mall movie because you know that movie is not scary to anyone it has barely even in the pretense of horror about it even though it was like rated x for violence it's always to me just been a relaxing mall movie where you can fantasize about being stuck in a mall alone uh, after the apocalypse. And right. the mall in that movie, if I remember correctly, has like a pharmacy in it where you can get like cartons of cigarettes. It had a skating rink. It was a massive, massive mall. So um, there's that. Both of the Gremlins movies are oh. different types of mall movies. Yeah, I think the, you mentioned that. I needed to catch up with Gremlins 2. I've never seen Gremlins 2. Gremlins 2 is great. That's That and Dick Tracy are the first two movies that I remember seeing in the theater, uh, which turned me into a homosexual because the, the uh, Dick Tracy had Madonna on the big screen and uh, Gremlins 2 had a transsexual female gremlin that was dressed like a whore. And I fixated on that because I loved like makeup and high heels and boobs and everything. Um, but the first Gremlins has a finale sequence that's in a Montgomery Ward. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot about that, man. Yeah, he's like going through being chased by uh, the main Gremlin who's like shooting a crossbow at him and all this shit. And then the second one takes place in basically Trump Tower because uh, there's like a Trump. I, I, people have told me that Gremlins 2 is now a really trendy movie, which it never was before. Um, but there's like a Trump character named uh, Daniel Clamp, and the Trump Tower is called Clamp Center. And it has like, it's basically a, a late 80s mall in a skyscraper thing with like frozen yogurt shop and salad bar. And just, it's it's a cool set. Yeah, I remember being obsessed with Gremlins and Dick Tracy just from the marketing because Dick Tracy was like promoted everywhere. I feel like they had McDonald's cups or something. I don't they know. They did. It was like everything was Dick Tracy and Gremlins too. 
And so I was so obsessed with Gremlins, we went to Movie Gallery, because Movie Gallery still existed, and it had carpet. I do remember that. And uh, I was trying to get Gremlins, the video game on Nintendo, to rent. <laughs> and it was out every time I went. And I remember the one time it was finally in, because uh, they would have, like, back then, <laughs> It's so weird to explain this shit. There was they actually would have the cover, you know, the like the fake box, and it, and then they would have their movie gallery box behind it if it was in. And so you'd be mm-hmm. walking by, and the box, you know, any of the ones that were flush against the shelf, you're like ah. And so every day I went in, somebody kept that Gremlins game for God knows how long. And so I walked in, and they had it. And I remember grabbing the the box. I was like yes, oh. pumped my fist. It was like uh, you know this this nerd's dream. And that game was god awful. It was so bad, uh, but I think I beat the whole thing. Uh, but I, I was obsessed with Gizmo as a kid. I loved that. So, yeah. So yeah, I, my brother had the Gremlins two Game Boy game, which was like really difficult and also pretty awful. And I played that, <laughs> played the hell out of that. I know. We all just got. We're easily psyoped, aren't we? I mean, uh-huh. it, just, it just does <laughs> seem like you know, like what you were saying about that whole. That whole non-event about Ghostbusters, like it, like broke up friends, like yeah, over that dumb Ghostbusters reboot, and then this thing with the Joker. Like you're right, it's just we're so badly. You're just it's like the same people. I always had this had this conspiracy theory. It's like the family Christian stores were run by atheists. They're like <laughs> the Christians are really like this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's just like we're just so malleable and predictable. Sometimes if we're in a quote unquote fandom, or I guess a a party platform or something like that, you know? Well, that's the, like, totally what's happening with Joker is that, as I was saying, it it was, it's just like the first time they're doing the inverse of the marketing that they did for, like, Captain Marvel and uh, Ghostbusters and all the, like, female reboots of everything where they kind of... Uh, make it seem like there's this giant uh reaction against the movie coming from like clansmen (laughs) waving torches outside of the white house (laughs) and uh it's entirely like made up like making the controversy up creates a little bit of the controversy but like that ghostbusters stuff the promotion for that went on for like a fucking year like they were saying all of the incels and white supremacists and misogynists are just round the clock harassing yep. Leslie Jones. Um, and the movie and, is literally about an incel as the villain. Like they, yeah. and they give a sermon at the end about how incels suck and they're causing mm-hmm. all the troubles in the Western world. You're like, oh, okay. And they did that with with Get Out. They rolled that movie out as the moral imperative for mm-hmm. liberals to support POC filmmaking and that was right after the election what? so they were like to defeat donald trump you have to go see we'll this, this movie, movie. What do you and think? tell all your friends what's your take on armand white oh i love armand white <laughs> I, I mean his him. takes aren't really like consistent and they they don't really make sense but he's a great troll I just i love him man like the yeah he's I was, awesome i was introduced to him because he's the one dissenting review about toy story 3 and at the time I, you know i was just a basic bitch uh liked anything that Pixar, uh, Pixar did. And uh, so I was like, ah, oh, man, Armand White, what is this guy doing? And I started reading his reviews. And I think even at the time, I was like, there's something here. And then the more I read him, I was like, man, this guy is so fun. Yeah, so he's just one of my favorite. Like, his review of uh, Get Out was, was fun. Uh, yeah, so he just... He yeah, just he's awesome. Rolling. I mean, the only film critics that I like are uh, Armand White, Rex Reed, especially like his like books from the 60s Parker Tyler whom Myra Breckenridge is based on wait wait, wait um, no, and... you got to slow down like I'm 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 rediscovering my film love I went off the radar for okay. like 7 years so who who is Re- Rex Reed uh Rex Reed he's he kind of looks like Elvis in the 60s he popped on the scene he has this like shoe polished black hair he's still alive he's very very old he's very gay um uh he always championed like movies from like the 30s and 40s like old hollywood stuff when liking that kind of thing was more exclusively uh a gay thing um and always seemed to hate new movies uh who else did i say oh parker tyler who's like uh another unhinged gay cinephile from the 60s who wrote a lot of 
really good books. Um, he's sort of proto Polya, but uh, in terms of like gay film criticism, the celluloid closet is very famous as an overview of like gay representation in cinema, but it's written by Vito Russo who adds this like sanctimonious gay victim uh, oh, okay. tone to everything. Right. But it's still like a good overview of the history of gays in cinema. So th- there was a documentary made of it for HBO in like the late nineties, but Parker Tyler is like the fun inverse of Vito Russo. Um, and uh, Gore Vidal's Myra Breckenwit- Breckenridge, which is about like a crazed male cinephile who uh, gets a sex change and like rapes the cowboy and like uh, fucks around in the Hollywood studio system um, was based on Parker Tyler. Parker Tyler. And then, of course, the only film critic that matters right now, Ty E from Soiled Cinema, right. who comes on my show a lot. Man, he has seen so many movies. I looked at his his sidebar. I'm just scrolling through to try to. I was like, oh, I wonder what he thinks about this movie. I'm scrolling through, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. <laughs> I mean, he's reviewed so many movies I've never heard of ever. Nobody's heard of them. Man. You can't even get them anywhere except on that like um, uh, torrenting site right. that uh, like my brother got access to it, but I'm such an idiot with technology. I don't know how to torrent anything. And that's like I'm I'm talking about real torrenting. I'm not talking about like googling something and clicking right. on a link. Yeah. Like, you know. Um but yeah, nobody's ever seen any of those movies and they're just completely lost to history and he's literally the only resource for this stuff cuz the countries themselves, you know, like Germany, France, whatever, they don't give a fuck about their film history. Like they like it's all in the gutter. They're right. probably watching Captain Marvel too. See, yeah, um, and and I do think I mean some people, especially in our corner of Twitter, have been mentioning you know the problem when you don't have like patrons of the arts, you end up with this very bottom line paint by the numbers stuff, and and we are people you know consumers are easily psyoped, you know very mm-hmm. easily and malleable. They don't, and this I noticed this, I I would make fun of India sometimes when I was there about how repetitive a lot of the Bollywood films could be, but really it's just all the studio systems in the world are like that now. We've kind of regressed to the 50s studio system in Hollywood all over the world where very formulaic content just kind of makes it because people are looking to escape from whatever and they don't really care. Like the guy, we went and watched Downton Abbey, the movie today, and the guy next to me, bless his heart, you know, good guy, uh, but he laughed at like almost every commercial and every trailer and my wife at one point, like he laughed. I heard him laugh. But I don't think she did. So my wife's on my left. I was like, that was awful. <laughs> me and my wife, me and my wife are it's like, you know, we've, we've made videos together. And so we're, ex- we're excruciatingly annoying about this, you know, audio visual. Like, ah, uh, they, you know, they could have cut about five frames earlier there. I mean, we're mm-hmm. that like anal about shit. And so, um, so, but I realized it's like, most people are just not snobby, you know? So they're just, they're just taking what's, yeah, they're just looking to get away, you know, go into a, go into a, a cave for two hours. And so, I, yeah, I understand going into the cave and I like going to the movies to go see anything, even though all movies, all of them are just absolutely terrible now. And it doesn't take a snob to realize that yeah. it's, just, it's just objectively true that it's all just, it, this is like the worst moment for cinema since, since the beginning of cinema. I'm serious. Yeah. This decade, this is the end of it because of liberalism. Um, um and yeah, the blame lies nowhere else except for on liberalism and political correctness. But uh, I still go to movies all the time because I like getting away from my phone. Um, right. and uh, like, I guess really the only thing remaining that's good about Austin is that it has more movie theaters per capita than I think that's any other city. True. And so. Yeah, and because of all the all the Alamo Draft Houses, like the real ones, the yep. show revival screenings are here, uh, and also the Paramount, the big old '30s movie house. Um, I get to see a lot of stuff on the big screen that I never thought that I would be able to, like Jacques Rivette's Out One and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, what what we're saying? Oh yeah, movies are absolute trash. We have uh, returned to the 
studio system, the, or le- at least the repressiveness of the studio system in a way, but like with none of the quality, none of the quality control because uh, like everything conforms to such rigid political propaganda rules that it doesn't reflect any kind of truth. And there's maybe one movie a year that slips through that it resonates with like some sort of experience that a human being has had like Blade Runner 2049 right. was the only one that matters this decade um, that, that came out of Hollywood and then the uh, Luca Guadagnino Suspiria, right. but basically what with the uh, impetus uh, or the demand for uh, multicultural diverse casting and anti-white messages, everything has to be done as calculating uh, political propaganda to support the Democrat Party, so it's it's not going to reflect human experience, See, and it's not going to be art. It does remind me a lot of Bollywood because in Bollywood everything is very. It's not necessarily political correct that's dictating it. It's more, um, I guess, consumer expectation. What is it? I, it's it's something people have just gotten locked into the formula. Now the thing that is subversive sometimes in Bollywood are their song and dance numbers. And so, like, I made a whole playlist the other day. Um, so that's going to be my 2020. One of my side projects is based Bollywood, showing uh, song and dance numbers that just subvert modern culture in a in a kind of uh, you know maybe not disrespectful way. And uh, some of it is just embracing tradition. And so some of their dances are just are fascinating. Like just great rhythm, great music. Um, and very colorful, you know, and just mm-hmm. and something very uh, ostentatious, which sometimes is just frowned upon in in the Western world. Like I went back to go see that movie, The End of the Tour, about David Foster Wallace, and his. Uh, they had a mall scene in that because I, I wanted to see what it was. It was just so sterile, like the mall scene. I mean, I guess it fit their aesthetic for what they were trying to do with that movie, but it didn't. I did not feel like going to the Mall of America from seeing that, you know. And I think mm-hmm. David Foster Wallace, with he loved TV. He he was a he was an avid like consumer binger of TV. So I think he would have probably liked that to be more like like the kind of thing we're doing here, glittering images at the mall. Like I think he would actually like that. Um, but yes, everything just seems very sterile to a degree functional perfunctory you know well you can't um you're not allowed to show people uh enjoying their wealth or displaying their wealth yeah and see bollywood Um, does that with a yeah they're always showing the wealth on display yeah so you you know like in the 80s you had dynasty in dallas Mm -hmm. and knots landing and all these glamour soaps that were there specifically for aspirational fantasy purposes right but since i guess the 90s but it's really tightened in the last decade um you just have rich people whose wealth is entirely off screen you know it's implied like you know that they never want for anything but unless you add some kind of cynical little satirical framework about exactly. how they're bad about yep. how rich people are bad yep. um you're not allowed to show them having any fun yeah when i was in india so the book that got all the attention was called behind the beautiful forevers uh written by a well-meaning white woman who she was like the story goes she was in her apartment she tripped and fell and like her like hurt her shoulder or something like that or clavicle on like a pile of books and she was like ah uh, I don't know it was like a wake up call for her it's like I'm sitting here in this uh, in this uh, rich situation and and I almost died like falling on my house and so she <laughs> so she went to India I mean credit to her she, she stayed there for four years to do this research project but the problem was she had a translator uh, her understanding of Indian culture like I I made I couldn't finish the book, you know, and like the vlog brothers, Hank Green, uh, John Green, he was like, you know, uh, plug in this book. And one, I think it won a, a Nobel, no Pulitzer or whatever. And I just couldn't finish the book because even though she was in India for four years, she saw these people as specimens. And so someone had just posted this uh, this thing that liberals. Uh, it was like a little heat map. It's like conservatives tend to uh, 
prioritize their nation and the and their uh, family, and that liberals tend to prioritize the world, this global abstract world of people. But the problem is when this liberal woman was there seeing these global people, her takes on them were all so perfunctory. She wasn't seeing them as people. She didn't get the subjective reality of it. She she treated them as science projects. So even in the attempt to try to to love the world, it ends up they end up missing it. And so if they were like there's there's a Bible verse that says this basically a prince comes I mean if a poor man comes to power and becomes a prince he will become a tyrant and like if she were to give this dude that she pitied what he wanted he would just turn around and kill all the other Indians around him who would been mad at him, you know and yeah. you know she'd be he'd be fine with her and I was like oh that's a nice white lady but that's lit like kind of literally how Britain took over India is they just settled disputes between warring Indian factions so. Like, a, you know, this outsider comes in and thinks, oh, I've got this abstract view of the situation. Yes, it's abstract. That's exactly what it is. And it's just this, it, it comes back to what we're saying, this whole antiseptic. Like, it's not real. It's not people down in the mud together uh, learning. And I think what I find so comforting, like, I, I think that's the word that we, we come to back to as far as, like, a tactile word of carpet and mall and cigarette smoke even and, and scent is, like, it threads the needle between uh, the church and city hall you know it's not like mm-hmm. it is it's a community place where you're not yes people are enticing you to buy but you're not being forced to buy whereas in either of those other two places <laughs> yeah it's pretty dictated what you're supposed to do yeah absolutely but that that like kind of a uh, well-meaning liberal white woman exploring other cultures stuff that was declared racist and politically incorrect only very recently because there was a lot of that at the beginning of the decade uh like eat pray love and the help and stuff that was like written by uh benevolent white women uh, about other cultures or about minorities and the message was you know 100 percent on message democrat stuff uh, but it was declared after the first round of like moral panics about cultural appropriation that like white women were just not allowed to even like talk about other cultures. You can't say anything except like, it's not my time to talk. It's their time to talk. The people of color get to speak for themselves. I, as a white woman cannot, I, it is not my time to speak. So it just is this ever like escalating tower of little puritanical rules about like whose stories are legitimate right that has effectively barred out the liberal white woman from even doing this harmless eat pray love stuff about like how i found the other culture beautiful or you know they can't even do that and when we went to india we had that sort of it was just real naive like i think a lot of these people are very well-meaning but it's like i'm like i you go over and it's it's almost like you're this uh you're not really a participant observer which they teach you in cultural anthropology is really the best thing to be as a participant observer not someone who's outside and not interacting at all um and so because you don't it's not human when when all is said and done it ends up being you know just a science project or something like that um but it is so hard to do that for human beings because we we tend to be like oil and water you know, when we when there is some sort of intervening, like bottom line, you know, it's like I believe in Jesus or whatever the thing is, or I believe in the Democrat Party. I believe in this party mm-hmm. platform, and that's why so much of our political debates just dumb because everyone has their one hot button, and the demagogues realize, oh, if we play this hot button against this other hot button, then they'll keep fighting, and we can still stay here in office pretending yeah. we're arguing about it. You know, and so demagoguery just lives off this this sort sort of thing you know um but yeah i only care about the if people like scents or not like like arabs like perfume so sure i like them before they before they immigrate over here and like acclimate to the the democrat puritan norm and get rid of all their oud and everything 
uh they're woke about sense um so yeah yeah that's great um they should keep that when they come over here but no because they're under the influence of i just imagine like fucking nancy pelosi having like some sort of allergic attack and like <laughs> like benevolently telling them that that how that affects other people's right. allergies but, but and see, stuff and that's what i do love about human beings is people just surprise you everywhere you will think that they they have a defining characteristic and then all of a sudden they'll have this maverick you're like oh this person is a dyed in the wool hindu or dyed in the wool muslim or dyed in the wool christian but then someone comes along and says you can't do this and they're like excuse me what what'd you say i can't mm -hmm. do oh uh, no i'm doing that thing <laughs> Plus, yeah you know in in 2000 i mean i saw that a lot in india where indians would just totally not follow the party platform because i was like no i like this i i don't really care what you say i'm still gonna do that thing even though you think it's like heresy you know and i was having this debate today with uh, about some christian ideas that it's people like owen cyclops uh tweeted it like he's he's coming to a more faith-based thing but that he's running into this frustration where everyone's trying to play pope with him oh well you have to do this oh you have to believe it you have to read this book and it's just and uh a lot of this stuff i feel is asked and answered but people again don't they're afraid it's almost this uh i don't know where did it come from it is this this orthodoxy like whatever and you you pick whatever your thing is that you're you are allergic to Maybe you're not afraid of it, but whatever thing you're allergic to. And it's with scent, that makes sense, right? It's like, oh, I'm allergic to that. And therefore, we need to have an environment where I don't have to smell that and start coughing. Yeah. And as as I outlined, I guess we haven't talked about it on the podcast in a long time, but on the earlier ones where I talk a lot about the, uh, the tenets of perfume nationalism, my kind of like a joke philosophy, uh, you have to wear strong perfume everywhere you go, but you have to uh, have a multi-tiered approach to manipulating people in order to get away with it. So um, I have a kind of almost approach. That's yeah, good. no, okay, really, yeah, like good. like you're like the tentacled beast coming at them from different directions. And since I'm like literally the only person that's thought about this or okay. understands it. Uh, I can tell you how to do it because okay, I've been obviously. doing it for years. Okay, you get a new job. Uh, the white women, the women especially. I'm going to tell you 90% of the time that people are uh, policing a smell in the office, it's going to be a woman. Right. Um, it's just something about it. Men, even if they don't like a smell, they're largely not going to think it's worth approaching you about or right. making a big stink about. Um, but... As soon as it comes up for the first time, you sort of start talking about scent and how it's a little hobby of yours and you're really into it. And they'll think, oh, that's so unusual. He's kind of an artistic type. He's kind of a kook. So they put you in that <laughs> category, uh, maybe with a little suspicion of autism, like a little suspicion of mental illness, which they can't criticize. You also Ooh, have to nice. charm them with humor uh, so that they think that you're funny, so that they begin to see it as a sort of disarming, charming trait that you have, that you come into work smelling of these ancient things that nobody in their right mind in a self-respecting liberal city as a white person would smell like. Um, and you can even try to get them into it. Right. Um, you can maybe ask what kind of smells that they like. You can maybe give them little gifts like the mob. Um, so they owe something to you. Uh, also, another key part of it is mixing up your wardrobe. If you wear the same thing every day, then they'll more likely place you as the smelly culprit. And if people dislike that particular scent, then they'll really go after you. And they'll say, you can't wear that one anymore. If you're constantly flipping the script and wearing something different every nice. day, there's bound to be something that they like. Right. Um, after all of this, after you are indoctrinated into like all of these various levels of science, perfume Scientology, you can eventually <laughs> reveal the political truth that you're doing it to revolt against the modern world. Uh, this is like the last tier. Most of them probably won't get this, but you can if everything else fails. Just tell them, 
I'm wearing this because it's a direct reaction against the repressiveness and censorship of this cursed decade. And nobody can stop me. You can go to HR. You can try to get me fired. Do what you want. But usually if you've made them like you and if you've manipulated them uh, in the previous ways that I've mentioned, then they're not going to go to HR. But it takes like they have to really um, be confused by you and not know what to do. Otherwise, they'll police scent on women so fast, just like women don't like when other women um, wear too much makeup or look too attractive or anything. They'll like start rumors. They'll go to HR and be like, she is wearing so much perfume. They'll do it to other women really fast. And uh, But no, you have to decide. You also have to be immune to um, the basic bitch comments of others. Because if you're wearing something old, everybody, nobody knows how to talk about this stuff. They just call you old woman or old man. Yeah. So th- their concept of what smells good. First of all, they think that all smells are bad right. because they're Puritans. All smells are bad. Everything. Yes. Um, so their concept of what smells good is not accurate. You can't, they're not, it's not like everybody's opinion is valid on this. Okay. Like my opinion supersedes. Oh, I know about this shit. It is like we've taken a time machine back to caveman era in terms of scent. You're absolutely right. Because everything is formaldehyde and Febreze. Yeah. And you can, you can lie to people, you know, to be nice, you lie to them and act like their opinions of what's a good scent is like valid. Right. Um, but it's just a lie, you know. You, if you're into this stuff, you know it's actually good. Right. Um, but yeah, they're they will very brazenly tell you that everything, all, everything you're wearing is like weird and old, and they'd prefer that you wear some like transparent, minimalist, modern, cedary thing. Um, but you just have to ignore that. You have to believe that you're right. Right. Okay. That makes. That makes sense. So I actually have a few. I did a little uh, sampling today. Went to the Eternal Dillard's. Managed to squeak my way through without being accosted. Um, mm-hmm. So I got Youth Dew. I'd never actually smelled Youth Dew. I've heard you talk about it. So what's uh, my son hated it. But <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. It, I, I, so what's the story with Youth Dew? Where, where, where do you stand on YouTube? Uh, youth Dew is one of my top 10 favorites ever. Youth Dew is an entire lifestyle Again, it will appall the modern nose because I it's so... I did not expect it to smell like this. Because when you said the word youth do, I, ex- I s- assumed... No, it smells like a sarcophagus. Yeah. It smells like a mummy that's like covered in cloves and, and spices and frankincense. It smells ancient. Right. Um, but youth do uh, came out in 1953, put out by Estee Lauder. And it was the signature scent of Estee Lauder. Um, before they had any other perfumes and uh it was released as a bath oil because at that time women were not supposed to wear perfume by perfume themselves a man had to give it to them so because it was released as a low as a cost effective bath oil women bought it for themselves um and they eventually released a whole line of products other perfumes and whatnot but youth do is amazing because it still exists and uh, so many different uh, body creams and oils and deodorants and whatnot, and it's so affordable. And if that were released as a two hundred and fifty dollar niche Tom Ford perfume, mm-hmm. people would be really into it. Called like exactly. you know, smoky frankincense <laughs> or whatever. Um, but it's so it's true, like man. the ultimate old lady perfume. Um, but it's what Joan Crawford wore. It, it just transports you to another era. Uh, it's very like old Hollywood and it's only about $35. Yeah. I mean, just looking at this picture of Blondie and Damone in, uh, fast times and smelling this, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm back at the, I'm back at the mall with my grandmother again. Oh, a a friend of the pod who has a really awesome Instagram account. She's not on Twitter, but she told me that youth do was like the original punk scent in the oh, late seventies, which makes sense. Cause that's when, cause it's such a patchouli heavy scent. Yeah. Um, but all the original punks, when it was like really a fashion thing, they all wore youth do and taboo, which is like a drugstore perfume from the thirties. That's similar. That's wild. So I, the next one I got was Aramis, but it was just the eau de toilette. So what is the difference between the eau de toilette and the perfume? 
Is there? It's supposed to be um, different concentrations, like the amount of perfume oil versus alcohol. It goes from uh, eau de cologne through eau de toilette to eau de parfum to extrait or parfum, which is like the pure oil. Um, and they very rarely release things and extrait these days. But there's, it's not an exact science because like okay. everything Estee Lauder is really, really strong. So like Aramis eau de toilette is super, super strong. Gotcha. So yeah, this, because this caught me by surprise. I heard y'all talk about Aramis, but I didn't, I don't really know much about it, and wow, it's uh, yeah. You know, to me, I'm I'm an idiot when it comes to taste and smell. I just if if I can notice it, I like it. So if I go to a restaurant, I'm just like, yeah, it tastes good because I can taste it, as long as it doesn't taste like cardboard. I like it. I'm like that too. Like uh, th- like people would think that I uh, am super elitist about scent and everything because I think about it and talk about it so much. Not the case. Because I like pretty much everything, and I enjoy when anyone wears any scent around me, except for one, Diaz and Durga Debaser, which is the only scent that's so bad, I wish no one would wear it around me. (laughs) Nobody else is like this. Everybody else is very open about, like, all the perfumes that they hate. They approach it with this extreme negativity, and they say, oh, like, pretty much everything that I like, Angel, Aromatics Aromatics Elixir, Youth Dew, Poison, these are all really poilable polarizing things that people are apt to say that they detest right. more and than I, that they and like. I think one of the prejudices is just untrue is that people think mainstream people are dumb and they're only going to like mainstream shit. And so like when I play, when I had uh Lauder for men and angel with the Alabama boys, two of them didn't really like Lauder for men granted, but the other guy liked both of them and all of them liked angel. They all liked it. And, you know, when I went to the counter, the guy tried to talk me out of getting Angel for my wife. And now she sprays it almost nightly. Um, so I That's think there's... so is... crazy that they actually tried to talk people yeah. out of buying certain scents. Because, I, I like, I'm such a nutcase and I'm so confident and know exactly what I want to buy that they, like, never even, like, attempt to talk me into anything. Right. What is um, that primary... They're just like, I'm just going to let this one go. Uh... <laughs> right. What is that primary smell like that hits most with uh, Aramis because it does, it's different to me. I think all of the Estee Lauders prior to the, you know, maybe the nineties have pretty much the same base. That's like a kind of musty Oak moss, patchouli musk, sheep breath thing, leather, uh, leather thing that uh, smells to modern noses very old, but Interesting. it's across. It's like in all of them. Like aromatic elixir uh, is very similar to Aramis. Okay. Um, and actually, the second Aramis scent, Aramis nine hundred from nineteen seventy three, is basically an eau de toilette of aromatic elixir that they put out for men. Interesting. And they would do this. They would put out. Um, corresponding scents for men and women that were basically the same thing okay uh like aramis for men azure for women aromatics elixir for women aramis 900 for women uh aliage for women devon for men and cinnabar for women jhl for men and it's really cool because before the concept of unisex was everywhere they would just release the same thing in like slightly different dilutions for men and women. Very chic. So the other one they had there was uh, Aramis Tobacco Reserve. Oh, was, I like that. Yes. That's a newer one. That was that man. Some of this stuff again. It's just like a revelation to me. It's like I would never think of doing this. You know, it's just it's almost like there's this whole renaissance happening right under our noses, if you will. <laughs> Yeah, because people don't even think of their sense of smell as like a dignified scent that they should be able to pay attention to. Like they like people are really that psyoped out of enjoying right. that sense. It's like it's like if somebody over the course of a quarter century just decided that you were not supposed to enjoy the taste of food and just gradually everyone started to believe that because what if what if your tasting food hurts someone else 
yeah, well, it's just the, you know, we're going to eat bugs and live in the pod, right? Like that's yeah, that's coming right next. now. Yeah. The Strange eating how liberalism is all just about escalating levels of like self-flagellation and punishment <laughs> and arbit- placing arbitrary <laughs> limitations on what you can enjoy based on vague, uh, nonsensical narratives of like original sin. <laughs> It's it's this vague, uh, like fog of original sin. It's <laughs> yeah, so it's true. just like you have to cut off all of your senses and not enjoy <laughs> literally anything. No sex because of me too. Because you might rape someone, even though they're constantly pushing sex, in the, you know, out of every screen around you. No smells because someone might be allergic. The most loathsome people on earth might be allergic. Uh, no taste because you have to eat bugs because the what you, the climate change climate is change. happening That's if you enjoy one, yeah. food yeah meat what? costs too yeah meat costs too much co2 we're going to have to dig, yeah. dump it dump it yeah you have to do little ceremonies of <laughs> separating your recycling and it does literally nothing but uh, little rituals but you'll receive social pressure to pretend it's that these dump. rituals are doing something the so rich- you won't really say it out loud to your partner or right. whatever how you how recycling is literally doing fucking nothing uh, because what if what if they think that you're crazy and don't care about the earth for the, all the children that you're not going to have? Not going to have the, yeah. reinstitu- <laughs> the reinstitutionalization of indulgences. It's so weird, man. Yeah, it's I weird. know. Oh, but just... yeah, the re- re- I'm like so adamant about people recovering their sense of smell as a source of enjoyment yeah. because. It's more powerful than all of the other senses because it's like a time warp. You're literally stepping back in time. That's That's the only way you can experience these spaces. And like when I first got into this and I was going around like Cole spraying Giorgio for the first time and like youth do, I was just like transported to the 1950s, the 1980s. Like it's incredible to smell this stuff. It's not just bad like people just have this instinctive embarrassed reaction of shame they just imagine someone thinking that they're dirty yeah. or something if they enjoy a smell it it is that madeline effect you know where you're taken back to some prior time and i think we are you know we're the accumulation of all this genetic biological material and to reduce us to this very the this eternal present uh where everything is sterile it is weird the whole thing is weird and i sometimes i feel like it's just a uh, you know the accelerationist explanation that it is almost kind of an unthinking entity at this point that's self-sustaining that it is just the this this uh coalescing of so many different ideologies because a lot of the way that you're describing liberalism really to me having grown up in the church reminds me of evangelicalism like yeah i mean it definitely used to be more where it's just like oh no don't go there i mean think about think about how weird the puritanism around nudity is and and i still have this like like vestigial uh fear of nudity but you go back and look at all renaissance paintings it's all nudes man you know it's all everyone's god's naked for crying out loud you know, but the, like the the discomfort around nudity is a quality of liberalism right now, which right. people like but, uh, might not understand this red pill. But like, I'm right. Like, people are really uncomfortable if they see any kind of nudity that's intended to be attractive or erotic. And f- erotic female nudity has been effectively banned from Hollywood movies for the last quarter century. Okay. Right. Showgirls and Basic Instinct represented the last time Hollywood tried to really do normal erotic female nudity. But Everything now, if you show tits whatsoever on an actress, it's viewed as rape. People are made instinctively uncomfortable. Uh, like stuff may be sexually graphic or whatnot, but they use these plastic dicks in HBO shows. It's not real nudity anymore. If they do have nudity, it's always like an extra or it's intended to be funny. Like in, um, uh, what's that? Uh, Midsummer. it's supposed to be like gross, like old, old people naked. So it's like a shock thing. But um, people have so compartmentalized their view of nudity into like, 
porn, which is a private thing between them and their phones, them and their computers, right. and like legitimate mainstream entertainment, which must not show women naked it's unless like it has secular... like a female director and they're made to look ugly. Right. It's like a sacred secular divide. But I do, I do kind of wonder though if Protestants are really to blame. Because it's like the Catholic Church before the Reformation did not have these sort of like in terms of art, they were not like stodgy and stuck up about this stuff. But uh, you, in the Protestant Church growing up, it was just always uh, like this. There, no, you know, it's this almost kind of like Mennonite aesthetic. Like I went to Christian college, and so it was like you know you can't even show your ankles if you're a chick. You know, like you can't wear tight jeans. Like there is this real weird fetish like reverse fetishization of you know the 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 trad wife we always joke about you know but i mean that's not even like a meme in in the culture that i grew up in it was just very uh you know but but at the same time what is the art that these people always promote it's like renaissance stuff it's like mm -hmm. the, the contradiction doesn't ever seem to hit them um so i just wonder where the parasites originated from you know, it's it's weird because you, you, if you went back to Margaret Sanger, you don't get the idea that Margaret Sanger had been like, oh, yes, well, nudity is bad, you know, like. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a strange amalgamation of of uh, forces that are enforcing this very sterile and puritanical uh, correctness or propriety or decency, decency on the world. You know? I mean, I feel like Camille Paglia and Bronze Age Pervert are the only ways forward. And right. the all, all of the Puritanism that afflicts the left right now mm -hmm. also afflicts the less savory uh, quarter and more dated quarters of right the right wing that we inhabit. Because like the all the ridiculous trad stuff where people. Uh, escape from the oppressiveness of liberalism and immediately have to make up a bunch of new arbitrary rules because they're so uncomfortable without rules. Mm. Um, that's the same thing to me. There's the, the new movement that I want to represent and I want to be a part of is driven forward by Camille Paglia. And I see it in Bronze Age Pervert. I see it in Red Scare. It's not just a right wing thing, but conveniently, uh, the left it has surrendered the entirety of art and culture uh, because of their uh, mania for censorship. Like they view, they're completely openly anti art. Um, and they are in the state of denial and think that they still own art. They don't. We've taken art from them. People don't know this. Like, normies don't know this. Um, but we've taken art from them. Yeah, it's just, it seems like almost totally like two railroad tracks, you know, parallel. Because their their censorship is their main thing, but it's like this this decent blasphemy rule that comes from the religious side of it. You know, and, and they're just two sides of the same coin where it's just in the same the result is the same whether you have god as the ultimate reason for your censorship you know you can't blaspheme god or on the other side of it well you can't bl blaspheme like punch down or whatever like whatever the thing is like you can't you know oppress somebody because you know hurting people's feelings is oppressing them so we're just going to have this no child left behind taupe tile uh f future it's going to be great and make no mistake, liberals literally believe in magic. They literally believe that saying the N-word or like a prohibited word yep. uh, means that a thunderbolt will strike down it's... you, the person who said it, or like a person of it color. They literally believe that there is a magical reaction from saying a prohibited it's word. It's true. It's, it, it reminds me so much of blasphemy rules. I mean, it's yeah. 100% a blasphemy sort of uh enforcement so. the the way that it's like you know i would say in the last like three years it turned into like uh people just like completely left behind analysis of intent when saying a prohibited word um right. and yeah. now it's like if you say the prohibited word whatsoever regardless of intent uh the mad the black magic will happen the dark magic will Right. be unleashed the lament configuration you know 
like like I, I it should not even be like called secular religion. It's literally just a made up goofy cult religion. Yeah, like, it's like the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, but not yeah. in any sense understood how it came into being. Like, and these are the people that circulated that flying spaghetti monster know, thing right? and in the 2000s like oh i watched john stewart in the daily show and i hate george <laughs> bush i'm so above all of this these are those exact people but they believe all this shit because they're cowards and they're too scared to speak out yeah. which almost everyone is a fucking coward about this yeah everybody and, and i have i have been too i i feel like i was in india and my quote unquote red pill moment, I think it was watching uh what's his name? John Oliver. And it was about what was it about? Like uh I can't remember which one it was. I think it was off uh maternity on maternity leave, like paid maternity leave, and he was like explaining how Sweden does it or what, something like that. And I was like, I mean my wife looked at each other like what just happened? Like, it was like in the blink of an eye, I was like, I hate this guy. Like, it, it yeah. because whatever, I was laughing along with him prior to that. And then in that moment, I was like, this is a joke. Like, this is a sermon. And it makes no sense whatsoever. Like, I, I just couldn't wrap my mind around, like, what the even premise was. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that so many party lines, we were having this, having this discussion with uh, somebody yesterday about how, I think the problem that demagogues and corporations are going to have and politicians and people in, of faith are going to have in these next five years is they've been used to blocks. They've been used to uh, communities that are in blocks. But more and more, it's like uh, it's more and more it's preference string theory where these strings going through the blocks and that string is going to be like, wait a minute, you're, you're three millimeters to the right of me. You're three millimeters to the left of me. I'm out. Like, no, I'm not going to... I'm not signing on the dotted line in blood for that dumb thing. And I think yeah. we'll see more and more people jumping ship from this dialectic, you know, this blue versus red or whatever. Yeah. And eventually those people are going to, you know, when it becomes more acceptable to dissent from liberal orthodoxy and there's more of a concrete mainstream uh, reaction against it. Um, those people are going to pretend that it never happened. They're going to pretend that uh, they never uh, yeah. severed all of their yep. friendships for abstract, nonsensical concept, religious yep. concepts that they made up, which they did in 2016. Um, they're going to pretend it never happened, and they're going to uh, act like people like me who have been telling the truth the entire time with my name and face attached right. um, that there is nothing to that. And they're just going to fucking join the bandwagon after it's safe. And that was, we were just talking about this yesterday. So we talked about two podcasts and one of them was um, Eric Weinstein's the portal. And he had this guy on and they were talking about preference falsification. The guy was an expert in this one area. And he was saying that when, once communism fell, they couldn't, they went over to interview the communists who were in power and nobody owned up to being a communist. And so what was happening for like 20 or 30 years, communism or socialism, like as such, you know, as a ruling faction was literally running on ideological fumes. Nobody believed it. No, but they just were afraid that they were going to get ratted out by their brother or sister. So they literally just towed the party platform and pretended to go along with it, not realizing that they were all operating under this emperor's new clothes situation and they they were afraid that if they lifted their hand first that they they would get it cut off and so once it was once they went over to interview the communists there were no communists to interview so i think i feel like some of this is is kind of like that and they, and they said really what you need is the it's the slow clap it's somebody delivers a speech you, know, you see the scene in the movie that delivers a speech and everyone's just kind of like uh looking around and then one person goes you know yeah and then as soon as he claps everyone's like oh okay i can clap and so i feel like in a lot of ways you're like that like with perfume nationalism you've you've start slow, slow clapping about scent and people are like oh wait i can i can like this oh i forgot about that you know <laughs> and then oh, so it's just like <laughs> we're all um of... yeah i i think that a lot of it is just that i have always had total like narcissistic confidence and everything that I thought which whereas most people have like 
more shame and they like uh they, they're more worried about what others think like i used to be a lot more social i used to be a lot more popular i like people i like being liked i may be this like sort of contrarian personality that has a lot of weird ideas but i don't like conflict and i'm nice right. to everyone that's the thing i just have always told the truth right. and i really can't name almost a single point in my life where i've been like intimidated out of it really and now since um pretty much literally all my irl friends dumped me for voting for trump in 2016 um i just like went online and like found a different scene of people to talk to um right. i don't know yeah they're the the sort of hypocritical cowardice when people eventually slowly accept these ideas that are very obvious to me but which they were too uh wimpy to speak up about um for a variety of re unjustifiable to me reasons um I don't like that, but that's how the majority of people operate. <laughs> yeah, it's just been a weird few years, but I'm really thankful for what y'all are doing. And and uh, uh, do we anything to look forward to in the perfume nationalist uh, universe in the next, next couple of weeks? Yeah, well, um, so we are making some changes. We're going to finally. Uh, monetize and paywall Amen. some of yes yeah no we've we've got to make some money okay. uh we're all poor um uh, we're gonna finally monetize on gumroad and paywall some episodes frankly some of the racier ones um right. because we don't want to get kicked off of apple because that's where like 80 percent of our listens are right. and a big part of the perfume nationalist project was doing this in the mainstream um and making it so that people can't immediately categorize what's going on right um so that they could like someone that's into perfume could conceivably just stumble upon it um the sort of right-wing weird twitter people could stumble on it and think the perfume stuff is weird that was part of the project but we've done that for um, 37 episodes at this point and we're doing um, DW Griffith's Birth of a Nation next week and that's probably going to be the first uh, paywalled episode I'm glad to hear <laughs> for it. obvious reasons yeah I'm glad to hear that you're doing it though um, yes mm -hmm. I will definitely be supporting uh, I've still been supporting I haven't even been had time to listen to uh, uh, Tech Wars but I've still been supporting them just because I've I'm just thankful this exists I'm thankful that these these little disparate communities exist and what i think you bring to the table is something we were having this conversation about how youtube is just a, a wasteland right now and the only thing really worth watching is like tutorials you know people building stuff you know people who are experts in a field and they're basically you know with no flair or fanfare just showing them doing it and uh, mm -hmm. and i think what i've loved so much about this podcast is that y'all you know so much about this and and i learned so much in just one episode i uh, probably gonna have to go back and start from the very beginning because some of these since i heard you talking about them but um i you know it was i i couldn't process all the information so going back and learning all this uh will be great i had one question from chat from well we had a few questions i'm not gonna hit them all but um so my buddy jared asked uh before the podcast is over if you get a chance ask him how he feels about liberals I think he's how I feel of, about liberals. I think he's kind of answered that question, but do you want to elaborate any more on that? Um, I mean, I hate them with every fiber <laughs> of my being. I, uh, I literally don't. I'm not actually that political, and I right. don't care about policy. Be except, I will vote against Democrats for the rest of my life as revenge for this decade. That's how I feel about liberals. And so you're voting Trump in 2020. Yeah, and I will always Trump will always be my favorite president and one of my favorite like countercultural figures and biggest inspirations. I know Trump is not fashionable on the right anymore because uh, people are fair weather friends. Right. But Trump is an important symbol and an important countercultural figure who is timeless and he is really the living embodiment of perfume nationalism. But yeah, I'll I'll uh, vote against Democrats for the rest of my life is revenge for this decade. 
Well, one of the fun synchronicities was me buying Water for Men and you explaining to me that they actually changed their – and that was my first choice. Uh, so maybe I am just Trumpian and I never realized it all this time. Uh, I bought this and you said – so they changed their design because of his – Perfect. His uh, scent that was no Estee Lauder um, in the early 2000s when Trump was really big because of The Apprentice, he put out his first celebrity scent, and Estee Lauder put it out, oh, and they okay. used the Lauder for Men bottle, but right. they swapped the color of the top. They gave it a gold top. Gotcha. It does. You are just. It's so true. Like looking at you know, I read his book after the election just because I was curious, and. I just, I just liked, I liked his style. Like I, I liked how his candor, I think that's the thing that is so refreshing to someone like me and you, uh, just the candor of it. Like that book, he wrote that, you know, he had a ghostwriter write it, but it's Trump's voice the whole way. Right. And he just hasn't changed the way he's talked in 30 years. It's, it's the exact same yeah. dude. You know, he has, he's just been the same dude the whole time. Um, but yeah, this does remind me of like the architecture in there even. It's just, uh, it feels very Trumpian. Yeah, I remember going in Trump Tower the first time I went to New York in 2011, you know, with absolutely, I'd never watched The Apprentice. I'd never thought much about Trump beyond that he was sort of an 80s pop culture figure. And I absolutely adored Trump Tower because it, even then, was one of the last places that you could see that kind of opulent uh, dynasty type architecture and atmosphere it was just so lush and luxe and wonderful yeah and that is just the dying thing just kind of like the malls like we've been talking about it's like uh i you know i feel like we're going to see i was having this conversation about youtube this morning i feel like we are going to see another golden age another renaissance happen we just kind of gotta we kind of gotta tread water water and stay uh, afloat long enough to get there uh, I think some good undercurrents are happening, and uh, you're on the cutting edge of that. So I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Anything else you'd like to say? Uh, no, uh, subscribe to our Gumroad when we have that up and going um, to hear the most cancelable episodes. And thanks for having me. You've been a you've been a big support, and I'm really excited that the show has resonated with you in this way and that you're like going to dillard's and smelling estee lauder scents it's wonderful it's been a blast <laughs> well thanks for coming on and uh stay tuned i'll if you're following me on twitter uh youtube i'll be uh sharing some links to their the perfume nationalist gun gum road when it's going live uh join in supporting if you're at all a fan of scents and uh the cutting edge of this new uh, spiraling into creativity realm that we're embarking on here. So no more taupe tiles and ceiling tiles and boring ass tile floors with no carpet that all smells like formaldehyde. We're going to have a great, great 21st century. So this is just the beginning. Hell yes. Return to tradition. <laughs> <laughs>